I can then come to the market then with the new and improved version. And then I can also take my listing and go, okay, we fixed that problem and kind of showcase that off either in the images or in the sales copy or whatever. So that way future customers can see that that fix. And now I'm, I'm running faster than everybody else because I've addressed the problem that the market has kind of brought up. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Rake and Profit show. This is episode number 39, and we have Nick Landowski. And I was actually just bragging to Nick about how awesome Google Hangouts is for like recording these like podcasts and YouTube. And I'm like, I've never had a problem. And right when I hit record, it's like, sorry, it's failed. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> so hopefully, I know I, I broke Google. But uh, yeah, welcome, guys. Welcome, uh, welcome to episode number 39. I'm excited for this one. I uh, got Nick Landowski and uh, Nick and I, we talked probably, I don't know, eight to 12 months, maybe more than a year ago. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. And, uh, you know, Nick, he, uh, we met because we were actually in a mastermind group a while ago. And I think it was, was it, was it Kindle publishing that we were it, talking it was, about? Or? It could have been a little bit of everything, a little bit of Amazon, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but yeah, all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, that was probably like three years ago. And it was funny because back then we were all kind of like transitioning from like Kindle publishing because there was like a lot of changes going on and like things were really unstable. And I remember you mentioning, you know, I'm going to get into private label and I want to start like my own podcast eventually. And here you are now a couple of years later and you're a successful Amazon private label seller. And I'm going to get your story and kind of your update in terms of where you've uh, been and, and where you are now. And you've got a podcast as well, privatelabelershow.com. And I'm going to link all that up down below. But man, what is going on, man? How you been? What's new since the last time we chatted? Uh, since the last time I chatted, we were just talking about, I, I made the, uh, the trek down to Florida here. So I'm now in the Tampa Bay area. So I kind of relocated to uh, a little bit of extra sun. So obviously, I was in Wisconsin before that and uh, wanted to be, feel more productive. So I made the move down to Florida, loving the weather. You know, it's just been great. And then uh, just been trudging along on my private label business, just kind of growing my brand. And then, as you mentioned with the podcast, uh, just basically trying to educate people and kind of teach them on like, you know, how to get started, what's going on and like what's working, what's not working. And a lot of the stuff that I share on my podcast is like stuff that I'm actually doing. It's not theory. It's not pie in the sky stuff that I heard or whatever and, and didn't act upon myself. So anything I kind of teach or talk about is, like I said, stuff that I've tried, you know, with success or even failure and just trying to encourage people to actually, you know, start private labeling or selling on Amazon just to, so you can experience, you know, the, the, the process of everything. But obviously we're all shooting after financial freedom to some respect. And, you know, I've been able, I've been very fortunate to be able to, uh, Kind of not have a job of not nine to five for for many years now due to amazon and uh, i just want to educate people on kind of the opportunities out there and the podcast obviously is is kind of uh, how i do that so well that's cool man it sounds like you're doing well able to relocate to sunny T tampa bay area which i'm going to be there 8th to the 12th so hopefully we can connect man maybe shoot a video over there or something but um hey let's let's talk about kind of your your story in terms of how you got started and kind of how you heard about private label, because I'm sure there's people who are watching right now on YouTube, listening on iTunes, thinking to themselves, you know, I've heard a lot about private label. It seems like everyone's talking about it. Why did you get into private label and then kind of share your story of how it progressed and maybe share some results in terms of where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So this is stuff I've definitely mentioned on my podcast or probably even when we've talked on, I think I had you on my podcast a while back and just different things involved with you know, getting involved in selling on Amazon, my first kind of stint or go at that, I think it was maybe four or five years ago at this point. It's, it's literally just been a blur. But, you know, I started off Kindle publishing and did, did very well with that. And then after a while, I kind of realized that, you know, this, there's more out there. There wasn't just selling ebooks on Amazon. So I came across, uh, this is, geez, this is many years ago. I think maybe some of your audience might know who Ryan Daniel Moran is. This is- I love that. Know, yeah, Freedom, uh, Freedom something or other podcast or whatever. And he talked about, he was getting in a private label at the time. And I was kind of like, oh, what is this? You know, what's this all about? So one thing led to another. And 
before you know it, you know, I'm kind of interested in private label as well and selling on Amazon. And I didn't even know that was really possible to sell like a physical good on Amazon in that respect. Like I didn't think that that Same was here. possible. You know, one thing led to another, it's just a matter of educating myself. And I already had a lot of Amazon knowledge from the Kindle space. So I just kind of transferred a lot of my internet marketing knowledge that I developed over time into, you know, this whole private label world. One thing led to another and it wasn't, it's not all sun, you know, sunshine and roses or whatever. There are ups and downs just like anything, but it's, it's a learning process. And just like with anything, like if you focus hard enough and you get the right education, and you take the right actions and things like that, you can definitely grow a brand and, and you know, grow something pretty large on a platform like Amazon. And it doesn't have to just be Amazon, but let's face it, that's the big sandbox right now that everybody wants to play on. So it just kind of one thing led to another and ended, ended up just basically building a brand on Amazon and a little bit of Shopify as well. But you know, things have been good and it's just a matter of launching more products and kind of building that out and building my audience around my products. and. Kind of just using all the tools at my disposal to maximize sales and you know just like i said though it's a learning process so even though i've been doing this for a handful of years now you know there's new things coming out all the time there's there's changes that amazon makes uh that you have to adapt to but a lot of just like anything though if you're focused enough and you kind of deploy the, the, the correct strategies you can you can build like an easy six seven figure brand on amazon in a matter of a year or two like there's so many people doing it you know, it's, I don't want to say it's easy, like anybody can do it, but truly if you are dedicated and focused enough, it's possible. So have you passed the six figure per year mark in your private label business? Six figures. So like what you mean? Like million or like six, seven figure, like you mean a million dollar business or? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean like there's a lot of people who are like, wow, like I would die to have like a business that generated like a hundred thousand dollars in sales. So. Oh yeah. Easily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So easily over a hundred thousand a month. Now, wow, that's really, you've, that, you, that, you've grown a lot since the last time we chatted. Yeah, yeah, because I was just kind of like tuning six, seven figures. Like, what is he talking about? Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, but I just want to be very, just be very clear to everybody. That's revenue. Okay, so whenever anybody hears these, you know, sees the revenue screenshot, and that's that's revenue stuff. Okay, so let's just be honest. Profit margins are going to be variant on the product and, and all these different other things. But you know, over a hundred thousand a month. But on top of that, it's kind of just growing, right? It's just snowballing. So it doesn't start off that way. Like you kind of hit these plateaus throughout time, like whether it be 10,000 and then 50,000 a month and then a hundred thousand a month. And then, you know, you go for, go for broke at that point. Now you're, you know, million dollar a year plus brand. And you know, that's, it's just a snowball effect. So it doesn't happen overnight, but you know, it's just a matter of adding products and the right products and just continuing to grow and market your products to kind of, you know, hit, hit the people you want to target. So. How did, how did your first product do? Well, my first idea, I don't want to say it was necessarily failed, but, and this is stuff I mentioned on my podcast, like the first product that I originally was launching, I realized after maybe a handful of months that it wasn't really a product that I was excited about. And I essentially just pulled the plug on it right away, really, before I kind of got too deep on it. And I kind of reevaluated where I was going with all of this and figured out, you know, I don't want to just slam random products out on that, you know, on, on Amazon, you know, I don't want to randomly private label things. So I kind of just, like I said, hit the brakes and actually just said, okay, let's build a real brand. Let's focus on a core customer uh, in a specific niche and let's strategize here. Like what are the products that they would want to buy and things like that. So my first product, I guess you could say maybe was a failure, maybe was not. But my first real, real actual product that I you know, continued forward with, with my current brand, that's a product that I'm still selling today and making money from. So, and I've adapted it as well. So it's just, you know, you know, didn't always make a ton of money. Like there's a lot that goes into kind of making sure that, you know, you're staying on top of things and, and driving traffic and all this and that. So it, you know, ups and downs and things like that. But generally, you know, if I'm still selling, selling it as a matter of a few years later, it's, it's a success, a success in my opinion. So. Well, that's cool. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about private label and stuff, and there's almost like an argument amongst, should you build a brand and really focus on serving a potential audience or go with like that shotgun approach? So you've actually decided to go with niching down and serving one specific type of person. Now, is that if we were to take a look inside your private label business and we somehow had access to all the products you were selling, are, are they all kind of directed towards a specific targeted person? Yeah, it's in my opinion, it's way easier. Now, there's no right or wrong way to do this. The shotgun method people do and they have success with. 
but I find that it's way easier to find a specific customer that you want to serve and you just sell them products, kind of that in a nutshell. And the reason why I think it's easier because you can actually, you know, find, let's say you're working with a supplier or a factory, there's a chance that they might actually make a handful of the products that you actually want to sell. You only have to deal with maybe one or two factories then at that point. Versus if you're shotgunning a whole bunch of random products, you have to develop relationships with maybe five, six, seven, eight different factories overseas or whatever. And that can be very time consuming. So I find just to, just to find one specific customer and that way you, over time, you start to learn about that customer, a lot of things. Like you learn different, uh, every product you launch, if it's all kind of underneath the same umbrella, when you create listings and figure out which keywords you need to target, all that stuff, it's always very similar. Like you, you understand the buying behaviors of, of the customer at that point and you get really in depth on like what they're all about and, and you can become an expert in that field essentially. Okay, so that way, you know, for your next handful of products, like exactly which ones those are going to be. And it all comes just from focusing in on that one customer. You know, you start having conversations with that customer, however you do that. If you're in their Facebook groups, uh, you just really, really get in the mind of that customer. And it makes, I think, private labeling a lot easier. It just it just really does compared to, again, the shotgun approach. Nothing wrong with, with that approach by any means. Again, I know a lot of people that do that and make a lot of good money from it, but I just think it's... For my own sanity, it's way easier just to serve that one specific, very niche type of customer. I think that that's kind of the route to go. I'm not suggesting that anybody's listening to this has to do that, but I just think mentally it's a lot easier. Is there any way for you to get like the the customer's email or have any way to follow up with previous customers? Like for example, you know, in my business, I have certain digital products that I sell and, and considering that I sell them on my own website, I get access to their email. So if I have someone who purchases, you know, I can follow up and there's a good chance that they might be interested in that because it's the same. Is there any loopholes or hacks or, you know, obviously not being against, not going against, you know, Amazon's TOS, but are, are there, is there anything like that that you do in, or practice in your business? Well, you mentioned customer email or email addresses. So whenever somebody buys something from you on Amazon, obviously Amazon doesn't give you their email address. You know, that's theirs. It's their customer. Technically, they don't even give you the phone number anymore. than they used to, I don't want to say hacks, but there are, there are data services that can probably pull you those email addresses, which you got to pay for. But that kind of goes against the grain of what that's we were risky business. Here. Yeah, it's, it's out there, but here's, here's what you should do. The email address is extremely valuable for a million different reasons. Now, let's say somebody buys a product from me. What I typically do is I have something called an insert card or something on the packaging. It, it varies on the product, but on the packaging, I want to direct them to a lead page or a landing page that I want them to go to. And one of the things that I might do is I might say, Hey, you know, if you want a video that shows you how to use this product better, or you want a free ebook or fill in the blank, whatever it is that you want to give away, have them go to your you know, lead page or landing page and give them an opportunity to enter in their email address and then give them what you said you're going to give them. Right. So standard stuff there. But once I have their email address, then I can do a lot of different things. I can, I can cross market other products to them. I can speak to them about anything I really want to. And, you know, I don't have to worry about what Amazon thinks at that point, because now they're my customer. Now I own that email address. And the other thing, cool things I can do too, then is I can take all those email addresses then and pop them into Facebook. And what I can do from that is create lookalike audiences, right? So let's just say as an example, I have 500 customers that, that gave me their email address after the sale. I can then go to Facebook, create a you know, lookalike audience from those 500 customers, and then or Facebook's going to say, okay, well, we're going to find you a whole bunch of other customers that are very similar to the email address you gave us. And that way, when I want to launch a new product or I want to send a message out or whatever it might be and find new customers, mm -hmm. Facebook helped me with that because I had that customer email already. So that's kind of where things get interesting. And I can, as a marketer, I can kind of reach again, new customers, sell them new products and kind of really grow and, and build my business. So you know, that's, that's really the route to go. And then as anybody will tell you, if let's say Amazon disappeared tomorrow for whatever reason, or you got you know, kicked off the platform or whatever, if right. you have like a good base of, of customer email addresses that let's say you're in the grilling space, you're, you're like outdoor grilling. And I use that as an example all the time, but you know, I have a, let's say 5,000 people on my email list that I, that I developed and there were customers of mine that bought things from me on Amazon or whatever. And for whatever reason, I wanted to take my ball and go home or go somewhere else. Like I have my own customer list already, so I can keep launching products if I do it effectively. I don't necessarily have to solely rely on Amazon at that point. 
Awesome. Great tips right there, especially with the lookalike audiences. I love, I love using them in my business. Think for a second, what do you, what do you feel is one of the biggest challenges that you're dealing with right now in your business? Obviously, you know, you've been at this for four or five years now. So I'm sure that looking back when you were brand new, you had different challenges versus when you were one year old in your business versus three years, four years, five years. What do you, what are you challenged with as of late in your business? Definitely outsourcing and or automating Ooh. tasks and things like that, because, you know, I don't care what type of business you're starting. Like, you know, if you're starting a brick and mortar store or anything in the entrepreneurial world, when you first start out, you're the jack of all trades. Like you're the guy or girl that has to do everything, right? You're, you're in charge of every task because it's probably just you, maybe another family member or whatever. But, and that's fine because you learn a lot of different things, but you can't really go fast. And as you find is with your business, the, the way to scale or the way to become more successful is to outsource a lot of like the day-to-day -day mundane tasks to somebody else or whatever it might be. However that looks in your business, it's going to be a little bit different. For me, that's been a huge challenge and it's always been a huge challenge. So uh, there's a lot of tasks that I do day in and day out or weekly or whatever that I don't necessarily want to do because I know that they're important tasks, but if I could have somebody else do them for me, then I can, you know, use my head, my brain to focus in on like how I can grow the business and things like that. This is very standard stuff, but what I find a lot of solopreneurs or entrepreneurs really just get in this rut of, is, including myself, is just not being able to effectively give up, give up certain parts of your business to somebody else through just maybe not trusting other people or whatever it might be. That's my biggest challenge. So there are platforms out there like Upwork.com. There's actually specific platforms too for outsourcing that focus in on for just for Amazon sellers. Mm. I had a guy on my podcast a while back who runs a site called FreeUp.com. And he has a whole bunch of virtual assistants dedicated just to helping Amazon sellers, you know, do different things like Amazon pay-per-click or product sourcing or customer service or any aspect of your business. So there, there are opportunities out there to uh, be able to have other people help you with your business. But right. I think for me, once I, if I do find somebody, it's, oh, I had to get rid of them because you know they didn't do it right or fill in the blank for said problem. Oh, I have to fire this person or get rid of them because they're just not showing up or doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's the, right. you know, like the frustrating parts that we've all been through if we've ever tried outsourcing. So that is my biggest issue right now because I spend a lot of my week sometimes doing things that really I shouldn't be doing. Not and, again. And, and I was gonna ask you what, if, you know, say you could find that perfect VA or you took the time to train them and, you know, cause from my experience working with VAs, it's always like, I always say, if you move really quick with a VA, you're going to spend a long time fixing things. Whereas if you, if you move slow and teach them step by step and they make a mistake, fix it, make a mistake, fix it. It really is a streamlined process. If you could have one thing in your business that you can outsource specifically a mundane task that you just hate. <laughs> What's like one thing right now, if you could take it off your plate, you would just be like, you know oh, what? Man. I'm going to the beach. Yeah, literally, literally. Amazon pay-per-click by a mile. I've been struggling with, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it myself, but it's something that is the biggest time sucker um, out of anything in my business. And I understand it completely in my head as far as like I can do it. You know, I've taught myself over the span of a few years, like how to be good at it. Again, it's it's a very important task, but it's just a matter of, being able to outsource that to the correct person or whatever. And I've, I've been trying like for geez, for like the past six months to a year, man, like finding software that would automate the process and like mm -hmm. talking to pay-per-click management services and companies and all again, different rates and things like that. And it's just a matter of like finding the right fit for my needs and things like that. So that's the one thing that literally, like if I could take that off my plate, I could literally go down to the beach where I'm at right now and just have a great time. <laughs> You know, and, but again, it's like that costs money to have outsourced. And on top of that, it's like, are they going to do it like you like it done and, and whatever. So there's always that battle there, but yeah, Amazon pay-per-click extremely important, but at the same time, it's like, man, it takes a lot of time, especially when you have a lot of products, like one product, no big deal. Right. But you start expanding, you know, two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 plus products. And it's like, that's a whole full-time job in itself to kind of manage that. Because if you don't manage something like that, you can essentially lose all your profits. Like if you have bad, bad campaign management for pay-per-click on Amazon, oh, wow. you know, you can be done. Like you could be in the red if you don't know how to manage it effectively. So it's, it, it's very critical. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. So you, we mentioned earlier for the folks who are just coming in, uh, Nick has a, uh, a private label business. He's doing, you know, over six figures a month in gross revenue. 
and uh, you know, he had mentioned that he he has a brand that's focused on serving a specific type of person. So Nick had mentioned that he really likes to niche down versus going with that shotgun approach, trying to serve people in all different industries. So I'm sure you're very well aware of your competition. Is that correct? I'm sure you have competitors. Oh, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what would you say is one of your advantages, something that you maybe practice in your business? Maybe it's a technique or maybe it's a mindset. I'm not sure what it is, but what, what would you say in your own opinion is your advantage over the competition? Well, there's so many different things. One thing I'll maybe think a point out here that could help somebody listening right now. Amazon is, is, a, is a very monkey see monkey do platform where somebody see somebody's having success selling a widget or a grill brush, right? What happens is there's going to be maybe hundreds of other sellers that that mirror copy that exact listing that use the same pictures, the same everything, and you know that's ultimately not going to be any good. So one of the things that I definitely learned early on is that you have to differentiate, you have to customize, you have to think a little bit different outside the box. Now, if somebody's selling a grill brush with great success, and I evaluate the market, and I go, wow, like this is a really great market I might want to get into. One of the things I think I have the ability to identify is how can I differentiate my future product to be slightly different, maybe improved or whatever, or even my listing, like how could I market it a little bit differently to go after a specific customer that nobody else is really talking to? So that I think is extremely important going forward for anybody on Amazon. One way that you can get all that data is just look in the customer reviews of all the existing sellers for a product. And if you see that on that grill brush that there's a, the, the handles breaking off or like a part of it isn't working correctly. And people are screaming from the mountaintops, the customers like, Hey, this product is great, but we want it to be even better. And a lot of times what I find is a lot of sellers fail to understand, they fail to see those opportunities there mm. and they don't, they don't improve or address the problems of the market. The market is speaking in those reviews, the Amazon reviews, that's where all the gold is. Okay. So then I can, if I'm a good marketer or just a person wants to solve problems, I can, I can read all that data on all these different listings, whether it be my competitors listings or future competitors, whatever. And I can go, okay, I need to, to fix said issue that is happening on all these products, maybe even my own. Right. And that way I can then go to my factory and go, Hey, can we make this stronger or this better on this particular product? Again, it could be my existing product or whatever. And that way I can then come to the market then with the new and improved version. And then I can also, take my listing and go, okay, we fixed that problem and kind of showcase that off either in the images or in the sales copy or whatever. So that way future customers can see that that fix. And now I'm, I'm running faster than everybody else because I've addressed the problem that the market has kind of brought up. So I think if you can think like that, you're going to be light years ahead of everybody because most people don't, they want the easy way out. They want just, they want to slam a product out there. That's the same as everybody else's. And they're not willing to like really break from anything other than that. And again, that's just, that's just putting a marketing cap on, but a problem solving cap on and like how you can improve a product for the masses, for the market that you're trying to serve. What I really like about that, Nick, is the fact that if you have to change something or improve upon something, it probably means that the average person product sourcing, when they go to Alibaba, they're not going to see that product because it doesn't exist for the most part. It needs yeah, exactly. So my, so my, my, oh, go ahead. I was going to say pretty much real quick. So that means the competition, at least for a while, you're going to be able to hold the competition down until, until the people who aren't lazy decide to start talking to suppliers and then the whole monkey. Yeah. monkey, so monkey, monkey. My, my best selling product actually came from that early on where I, I understood that the market wanted a specific type of uh, feature on a product that was being sold and nobody was giving them that. They were all just doing the same thing, following the leader. So I went to a manufacturer and I said, hey, we need to fix X, Y, and Z on, on this specific product. And I did that and then launched the product. And then nobody else in, the, in that market figured that out for like at least six to eight months, right? At least on, <laughs> oh, on what I did. Wow. So what I did is I just went full bore on that product. And now I have huge lead, right? For keyword ranking, for reviews, all these oh, things wow. that matter for that. So then I noticed about six, eight months later, people finally starting to see that like, okay, we should fix that problem just like that seller did. But at that, by at that, or by that time, it's too late for them. It's too late. Like I'm already ahead of the game on that. Now, what has happened though, in, in certain respects is some sellers have actually looked at my product that I spent time improving and made improvements on it above and beyond maybe where I'm at. So oh. 
there are things like that happening to a degree, but not many sellers are doing that. Amazon okay? wants That's that. Not- the market wants it, the customers want it. So give the customer what they want and you win. So that's really it. You just, you get that information wow. from, from feedback, from reviews and all this and that, like it's no secret, it's out there. It's just like how much time you want to invest, like really peeling through all that. And I think it's time worth spent. So, you know, it's very valuable, I think those, those reviews and you, that's how you get all that data because then I'm even looking at my product again, I'm light years ahead of everybody on the specific product. Like it's making really good money, but I'm already thinking about like even further improvements on it at this point, right? Like. I'm noticing the market catching up a little bit. Again, how can I even further improve it? So now I'm actually in talks with my, my main supplier on it to go, hey, here's, here's more improvements I want to make on this to make it even better. And that's really how I think you have longevity on Amazon with a product. Because a lot of times people sell a product for maybe a year and then fizzles out and they go on to the next thing. And I'm like, well, no, I might as well just keep improving it. I already did the work. Let's just keep improving it even more. And uh, that way, if I do things correctly and I just give the market what they want, I can, I can sell that product almost forever and ever and ever then, you know, like as long as there is a general market for it. Dude, you're thinking like the big companies out there, like think about the companies who weren't willing to adapt, who weren't willing to continue improving. Like think of any company out there, like even Amazon itself, they're always changing. They're always adapting. They're always releasing new things. Think of Apple, all the new things that they've been doing. So that's really huge. Would you say that there comes a point where you kind of hit this threshold where it's like, okay, there's not really any room for improvement. I mean, are there products out there on Amazon that like, say a product has, I don't know, 3000 reviews and it's like doing amazing and it's like dominating. Do you not really want to try to improve upon that? Like, or does it really just depend if, if the market's screaming improvement, it doesn't matter how many reviews there are, how many sellers there are. Just give the market what it wants. Right. And that's just fill that need. So like if it's a five-star product and it's just banging out amazing reviews again and again and again, because all the updates you've done, granted, you're going to have some people mad at the world for, you know, a product that they say isn't perfect or whatever. But if you notice trends or you notice like a lot of customers speaking to things that could be, it's like, I get, I get emails all the time from customers going, Hey, we really love this product that we bought from you, but let me give you a few suggestions. And they'll send me that as, as emails, you know, And and it's not like I have to enact on every single thing that each customer says. But if I notice like I'm getting maybe five emails a month where people are saying, Hey, you need to, you should think about doing this on this product. It would be that much more awesome. Okay. I'll actually probably consider that. Right. So just pay attention to what your customers are saying. That's really what it comes down to, you know? Wow. You know, I watch and I've spoken to a lot of people discussing, and this is a number one question. How do I find products? Yeah. And you know, there's people who go and they look for products with you know, certain amount of reviews, selling a certain amount. But I feel like this is some of the best advice that I've ever heard. Find a product that I guess is selling well, but needs room for improvement. Is that really, is that like the name of the game right there? So that's one way. way way. What other ways do you think different, think outside the box? So again, I'm big on finding a specific niche that you want to serve, right? So once you identify that, let's just say like, I don't know, give an example. I always mention grilling, right, on my podcast. Well, that's kind of a real broad field, right, grilling. There's a million sellers doing that already or whatever. But let's say I niche that down and I say, let's go after, like, females in grilling, females that love grilling. So now I'm getting more specific to a, a customer. Is there a market market. like that? There might be. There yeah, that's, be that sounds like yeah. a cool market, man. I tell you right now, if you know anyone who wants to come on the podcast. Yeah. So think about this, like, every <laughs> grilling accessory you see has got, like, what, black handles, brown handles, like, wood handles. Like, what if you made, I'm just speaking out loud here, but like, what if you focused in on like a female grilling niche and you had like pink handles or purple or whatever? I've just given your audience an idea here of like how to like niche things down. There, there's a lot of opportunities out there. So, it, so it's, it's not, yeah, yeah. You find like one or you find two, two things that you could intersect, right? Like two different groups of people. That works well with Kendall too. Yeah, yeah. You get, you talk to a specific person. So again, and just selling, like, instead of selling grilling accessories that I could buy at Walmart, you know, for next to nothing on my trip there. Well, Walmart maybe doesn't make grilling accessories or sell grilling accessories for a specific audience. Maybe I'm patriotic or something like that. I just want to sell grilling accessories that are maybe geared towards members of the military or something like that. And I'm doing red, white, and blue stuff, or I'm doing like active military stuff. Or I'm just giving your audience ideas there and like how you can talk to like a, a very specific customer. And you can really do this for just about any product, you know, like you can do this in the pet niche too. So if you're going after Maybe you want to sell cat stuff. Well, that's really general, right? Well, maybe I do cat 
people that like cats, but they rescued their cat at a adoption shelter or something like that. That's again, talking to a specific customer mm. and I'm going to create products that kind of portray that message or actively go after that. So, you know, you can try to take two things at least and find, you know, for your niching down. I think that really helps to start. But as far as finding products in general, just find a niche that you're passionate about first and foremost, in my opinion, it just makes life so much easier. You don't have to do that, but it helps if you at least have some interest in the customer that you're trying to serve or even some knowledge. Maybe it's something you're into in general. Like if you're a runner, as an example, and you're in the fitness and all this and that. Why not start a brand around something like that? It's something that you have passion around. Like you're going to be that much more amped every single day to open up that laptop to go to work versus like if, if I sold like cooking stuff for or and I wasn't into cooking, you know, like it, I just wouldn't connect with right. it. I wouldn't care. Money is money. And at the end of the day, you got to pay the bills. You got to do what you got to do or whatever. And that's cool. Right. But again, if I if I am interested in grilling, it's something I'm all about, man, I'm going to be psyched to like, dude, I got my own grilling brand. Right. And, and you can even take it a step further. Like, oh, dude, I already got a YouTube channel around grilling it as a side hustle. You know, just oh, yeah. I like sharing and talking about, it. I'm going to come up with my own line or whatever. So fill in the blank. And not everybody can identify that passion right off the bat. I totally get it. That's where the sandbox out plan, man. It's like something that you have an interest in. Fo focus in on, you know, drilling down and look at the market. What's, what's already out there. And then like we talked about, improve certain products or whatever, but talk to a specific customer. That's really what it comes down to. Don't be general. Cool, man. Awesome. Awesome tips right there. I, I want to get some patriotic grilling gloves. I, I'm, I'm actually curious, somebody please let me know in the comments, do those actually exist? I, I'm going to, I'm going to guess and say yes, because it's Amazon, but who knows that, that those are some really, really good tips. Yeah. That'd be, a, that'd be so, a hot seasonal item, you know, hot seasonal item for, for June and July and August and September. Right. I think this business would be great for somebody who is creative. You know, if you've done Kindle publishing or merch by Amazon, because you know, merch by Amazon is all about creativity, finding you're literally creating a, a shirt with a slogan or a design for a specific person. And, you know, there's a lot of parallels between Kindle publishing, merch by Amazon, and, you know, with, with private label, who would you say this business is not for? Well, who is private label not for? Yeah. I mean, we talked about, you know, it, it's definitely for someone who's creative, someone who likes to yeah. think and, you know, think outside the box and, and serve people and help others. If you have any, any bit of creativity or marketing in you or like thinking outside the box, that's who it is for really. You can, you can really succeed with it. But like, you know, if you're in a, I know you do like the arbitrage and stuff like that or whatever, that's kind of a different mindset, right? Like you're, you're, you have a whole different game plan on how you approach things. You're still selling things on Amazon, right? But if you want to do private label, like you can really get creative. You can really talk to a specific customer and build an audience and build a brand around and like if that interests you this this is for you but if that doesn't interest you like you don't care about building a brand you don't want to build an email list you don't have any you don't care less. you just want to make money on amazon there's so many different avenues to do that right there there are so many different channels to do that and that's all out there private label in my opinion just i've been in this game a while is definitely where it's at currently and where it's going to be going forward for at least a handful of years so here's the deal just taking this off a little bit of a tangent here but Let's say you build a brand up of like, let's say three to five products in your little micro niche brand, right? And you're making a comfortable living from it. Well, there might be a bigger brand out there. Let's say a bigger global kind of grilling brand that sees you on the radar and they might contact you and go, you know what? We're really interested in what you're doing. We actually just want to buy you. Like we want to buy your actual brand out because we know you have an audience. Maybe they looked at like your social media presence and you have a huge following or maybe even a little micro niche following. Is this happening? This is, this is what is happening right now. I am seeing this over and over and over again. And just for your audience, just so you know, this doesn't happen overnight, but I'm seeing over and over and over again, where there are a lot of private labelers out there just with small three, four, five, six, seven brand, you know, brand uh, products in their brand that they maybe spent a year or two building. They are again, making comfortable livings from that. But at the same time, it is very attractive to now sell those little micro niche brands. Okay. There's websites for this where you can put your private label brand that is oh maybe it's just even an amazon brand or whatever put it up there i don't know it's like different flipping sites for your brands and bigger companies will see that and they want to acquire you and guess what they'll pay you a lot of money sometimes they'll pay you what's the multiplier some, do you know i don't really know off the time i had what it is going to be for everybody but let's just say there are, there are private labelers out there getting paid millions millions of dollars for these brands that maybe they've only taken two years to build maybe they put their heart and soul in it for two years and they they're going to cash out over i'm not saying that's normal but I'm saying that that is happening in more and more frequency right now. 
So I'm seeing that. And actually one of my goals for the end of 2018 is to join that club of somebody that sells out my micro niche to a bigger brand, a bigger investor that is interested in that because I've already done all the work, right? And they just, they know it's profitable and they want to acquire that because maybe they have the same type of products and they just want to acquire my customers or whatever it might be. But I'm saying that that is where it's kind of going. And these private label brands are just where it's at. Like that, that's, that's the direction Amazon is going to because all the tools that they're giving the sellers right now, it's very brand centric. They want our brand, the brands to tell their story and all this stuff that Amazon is laying out is leaning towards that brand. The brand sector and focus as far as sellers, that's where it's going. That, you know, I, I see it on the, I see it every day with what, where Amazon's going. So again, you don't have to do that. I'm just saying it, it's, it's kind that's of cool though where it should be going though, in my opinion. Oh man, that is super freaking motivating. And man, you've dropped a lot of uh, awesome information. Hopefully next time we talk, man, maybe in like a year, you'll be retired on the beach. You won't have to work with any virtual assistants or you won't be running your PPC campaigns every day for for hours on end, man. But dude, really, really appreciate you coming on the show. I want to stay true to the time and everything. If people want to follow you, how, how can I get in contact with you or uh, check out your podcast? Yeah, sure. So you can go to privatelabelershow.com or you can just go right to iTunes and type that in. You can subscribe right from there. I have kind of this makeshift YouTube presence at this point where I'm putting some of my podcasts on there as well. In fact, today I'm going to be working on kind of making that a little bit better as far as just the appearance of everything. But uh, you can also hit me up on YouTube. And actually, you know, if, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking about how do I get involved in this private label game as far as like, how do I find a product to sell or whatever it might be? I actually have a couple of videos that I cut and put onto YouTube recently. Uh, I show you specific ways that I would use or certain tools that I would use that will help you through the process. So if you want to see how I might do it or how you can do it too, uh, check out my YouTube channel. I, I use like a handful of different tools, different methods out there. There's so many different methods, but- Yeah, you were talking um, about Viral Launch, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. So I that was my latest video where I used their product discovery tool. And I think it's like a 20 minute video where I just literally just fired up. Yeah, just boom, here you can see how I'm doing it and how others can do it. So that way it gives you some confidence into your own abilities to be able to go out there and, and start finding some products to sell. So check that out, guys. Like I said, it's on the YouTube channel. You can just do a search for like private label show podcast on YouTube and you can find I'll it. I'll link it up for for everybody down below in, in, in show notes and everything. Yeah, man, you rocked it today. Always, always fun talking with you. And hopefully I could see you possibly for some dinner or something in Tampa uh, mid-February. That would be a lot of fun. But for everybody watching, be sure to smash that like button on YouTube. Check out the links down below to go check out Nick's podcast, his blog, his YouTube channel. And also, if you guys are listening on iTunes uh, and you are enjoying this content, do me a big favor and leave an honest review. It really, really helps to get these videos out to more and more people to make a difference in the world. So with that being said, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Rakin Profit Show. Take care, All everybody. Right. Later, guys. Thanks for coming on, man.